Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Arif Malik. We introduced him two presentations ago. Uh, I'll just say that uh, he joins us from the University of Texas at Dallas, and he'll continue in talking about uh, some of his work, and specifically in this case about modeling uh, with the laser shock painting process. And with that, Malik, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to talk. Great. Thank you very much, David. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, a second time. So this talk is entitled Efficient Microstructure Modeling During Simulation of Laser Shock Peening on Selective Laser Melted Components. And there's been a tremendous amount of growth in uh, additive manufacturing, whether it's selective laser melting, powder-based directed energy deposition, wire arc additive manufacturing, and so on in, in metals. Um, one of the key problems is that in all of these additive processes, because of the heat accumulation during the build, the grain structures tend to be far less homogeneous than in conventionally manufactured metal parts. And the, the, the effect of that is that the mechanical behavior of the materials that are additively manufactured, the, the, the behavior tends to be inhomogeneous and anisotropic. And so what we have to do in, in applying uh, laser peening is to try to accommodate that inhomogeneous anisotropic material behavior so that we can correctly predict residual stresses and fatigue life and so on. So this work is, is, is really about those two things. One is the grain structure prediction in selective laser melting, and the other is, is then the application of laser shock peening to look at, look at uh, whether or not we can predict the, um, the residual stresses for uh, a specimen that contains a grain structure. So this work, I need to acknowledge my uh, postdoc, uh, Samir Sunny, as well as several graduate students who've been involved in this work and details of it can be found in a, in a publication earlier from this year where we incorporated grain structure, not only for laser shock peening, but also for micro machining as well. So this is, this is a journal that you could look at to find all of the details of the, the uh, uh, um, specific model formulations and so on, okay? So the outline of the talk really, as I mentioned, the first part is on simulation of the microstructure in selective laser melting. And for that, we created what we call a dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo method. So it's a, it's a new method, which is an enhancement over the traditional kinetic Monte Carlo method. And then the second thing is just to, the effects of including the microstructure in the simulation of laser shock peening. And we'll look at just a single shock on a cube specimen, but we'll do a comparison with the method that we, we've proposed with crystal plasticity. And you'll see, see that there's a very good agreement between the two. All right, so just a little bit of a sort of motivation for this. I've already mentioned that in additive manufacturing of metals, we tend to get um, grain structures that are inhomogeneous. We, oftentimes we get elongated grains because of the, the uh, strong thermal gradients. And so as a couple of examples here on the left, you see in these, in these first two figures on the left, A and B, these are from a 70 millimeter tall 304L stainless directed energy deposition structure. These are EBSD images. And in, in A, this is 15 millimeters from the top of the build, where you can see the grains are largely appro approaching somewhat of an equiax uh, morphology. Whereas at the bottom, this is seven millimeters from the bottom of the build, the 70 millimeter build. And you can see some columnar grain structure in this case. The, the, the next image, C here, you see three regions. This is uh, work by Sun on a 316L selective laser melting uh, specimen. So these are again EBSD images. And what you see here is at the top and the bottom, the grains are far more equiax than they are in the middle because of the strong thermal gradients that happen. And then on the right, far right here, at the top you see, this is an Inconel 625 selective laser melted structure. And you see there's a lot of variation in the grain morphology, elongated grains at various places and stuff. And so all of these, these phenomena are attributed to the, to the uh, strong thermal gradients uh, within the additive builds for this. Now, if we, if we want to do predictive modeling, we have to predict the grain structure. And there are various ways to do that. One of the methods that is, is popular is known as the kinetic Monte Carlo method. This was adapted from welding uh, by Rogers at Sandia National Lab. And so, for example, on the, on the bottom left here, you see an experimental uh, EBSD image of a 304L stainless specimen from Rogers. And then on the right bottom here, you see a simulation using the conventional kinetic Monte Carlo method. And actually the agreement is pretty good. 
in terms of the, the aspect ratio, grain fraction, and so on between the simulation. So this kinetic Monte Carlo method actually works quite well. But the caveat is this is true when the melt pool of the heat affected zone in the selective laser melting or the DED is fairly constant. But what we need to do in order to, to really understand how grain morphology um, results and, and to predict it, where we have strong thermal gradients, we need to accommodate um, a melt pool and heat affected zone that changes with time. In other words, transient uh, thermal behavior. So the hypothesis that we made is that we could take the kinetic Monte Carlo method, we could improve it to capture the interlayer and intralayer heat accumulation in metal additive manufacturing by basically making those heat, heat pool and, and um, sorry melt pool and heat affected zone transient parameters in the uh, in the kinetic Monte Carlo code uh, from Sandia National Lab. So that's exactly what we did. So what you see here on the right, this is just a video showing you, for example, for a selective laser melting the grain structure that results and um, this is this is this is sort of characterized by a melt pool and a surrounding heat affected zone that has this conventional comet shape. Now we know that that's not um, uh, the case that the melt pool and heat affected zone have this sort of comet shape, you know, in in the real world, particularly near the edges of the build. But the kinetic Monte Carlo method actually assumes a constant melt pool and heat affected zone. Again, very good for sort of steady state conditions. But what we did is we modified Sandia's code and we changed the the uh, melt pool and heat affected zone parameters dynamically at every increment of time during the grain grain uh, structure prediction. So that's in the actual uh, nucleation and growth site. All right. So, um, so in order to 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 get the transient melt pool and heat affected zone, we have to do some kind of either modeling or thermographic Im imaging or something like that. So what we decided to do was well, let's build a six layer in canal six twenty five structure with fifty micron layers. So we start with the powder and then we we use a um, uh, a, a raster back and forth scan pattern for the SLM. And we do basically 20 scans on each layer. We build six layers. And, as, and, and so this is simulated in Abacus. We solve basically you're solving the heat equation. We do that with boundary conditions. Um, and then we're implementing the classic Goldack heat source model for the laser uh, heat infusion into, into the powder to melt it, okay? So once we do that, we, we calibrate the, uh, the thermal uh, parameters from thermographic Im imaging. We did that from NIST uh, for the same material. And so if I just show you, for example, if we look at the, the um, thermal contours. So first of all, let's just look at the, the melt pool and heat affected zone boundaries. And so we've eliminated the temperature contours on these plots just to, on the left side, just to show you the brown heat affected zone and the red melt pool. So this is for looking down on the build, layer number one, scan number one. So the laser SLM scan is moving this way and you can see the melt pool heat affected zone. This is the same layer number one, but the 20th scan coming back the other way, you can see clearly the heat affected zone and uh, has grown dramatically and there's a little bit of asymmetry to it. And then you see the sixth layer near at the top of the build scan number 20 here in this case again you see some differences now if we look at that same six layer scan number 20 with the full temperature contours you clearly see the asymmetry in this case again this is looking down on that top layer and um, slm scan number 20. if we look through the depth these images ef and g are looking through the depth exactly the same thing layer number one scan one layer number one scan number 20 and layer number six, scan number 20, and you can see clearly see the growth of the uh, heat affected zone. And then again, the final right image is just the same thing, layer number six, scan number 20, but with the, with the full temperature contour plotted. So there's clearly asymmetry in heat accumulation in this. This is for SLM, of course, but it's even more a problem in, in powder-based DED. All right, so now when we incorporate those transient melt pool and heat affected zone, um, uh, conditions into the kinetic Monte Carlo method. So we now create a dynamic KMC prediction for the grain structure. So here's some grain structure predictions we did. This is for layer number one. And then we took, we took two, two uh, uh, locations on that first layer, uh, location number one right here, and then location number three, again on the first layer. We look at the grain structure differences and there are huge differences in the grain structure here. So we're predicting a three-dimensional grain structure, but this is just obviously showing uh, the two-dimensional image. Now, if we look at the third 
SLM layer. Again, those two locations, one and three, there again, you see big differences in the grain structure. And if we can compare these results to the conventional kinetic Monte Carlo grain structure prediction, doesn't account for the heat accumulation. You know, if you use the conventional method, you'll get the same grain structure regardless of which location in the layer you're looking at. Again, because the heat accumulation is not taken into account. So these results were published in additive manufacturing uh, last year and the information we found there. Okay, so now what we do is we take this grain structure prediction, the dynamic KMC prediction method, okay? And we're gonna adapt this for use with laser shock peening. So what is the motivation? Well, in almost all of the laser shock peening models, a, either a homogeneous, isotropic material properties or something like those are assumed, okay? And a classic example, this is work for Brockman. Um, Brockman was the very first person back in 1999 to do simulation of laser shock peening using the finite element method. He was also an instructor for a, uh, a great continuum mechanics course I took at the University of Dayton in, in the late 90s. So I really like to, to highlight his work, but this is a classic uh, simulation result for laser shock peening where you have multiple shots in a rosette here. You see this sort of nice symmetric uh, pattern of residual stress that results. And the reason for this is because it's homogeneous material modeling, homogeneous and, and, I, and uh, sorry, isotropic material modeling. Okay? So what we proposed is we can take our grain structure prediction and build uh, what we call a representative volume element model and then apply laser peening to it. And so this is a one millimeter cubed Inconel 625 structure. So the grain structure is, is, is uh, predicted using a dy dynamic KMC based on the selective laser melting. And effectively, when we incorporate this model into Abacus, every grain has a unique set of material properties. And so the approach that we took is an efficient approach that is known as the Johnson Cook whole patch material model. Now, so what it does is it, com it combines the conventional isotropic homogeneous Johnson Cook model with the whole patch relation that gives you the static yield strength as a function of grain diameter. So this is really each grain itself is still homogeneous and isotropic, but the aggregate of the structure is not because each grain has its own set of, of, of material constitutive behavior. Now, this of course still doesn't, it doesn't address the limitations that were discussed by Professor Okanya of kinematic hardening. Um, you know, we, we haven't yet looked at dynamic recrystallization as, you know, uh, uh, Professor Vijay Vasudevan has studied extensively experimentally, but what we, what we can do here is now we can have a, um, an aggregate, we can have an anisotropic inhomogeneous material definition for laser peening simulation. Okay. And, and if you look here on the right hand side, effectively what this means is each grain has its own isotropic yield surface. So you have an enormous number of yield surfaces that are operated on by the laser shock load. So let's take a quick look. This is a single laser shock peening pulse or laser shock pressure. And you can see here it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's Gaussian, but uh, because the, the uh, edge length of the cube is only one millimeter, the spot size is a little bit larger than that. We took the data from our uh, experimental characterization of the plasma spatial, I'm sorry, the, the laser spatial energy profile. And, and we use that with Fabro's 1D hydrodynamic model that's been discussed already. So the peak pressure is about 2.7 gigapascals. Um, and again, we're applying a portion of this Gaussian pulse there. So it's, it's a, it's a, uh, a two-dimensional Gaussian pressure pulse. So when we apply that to, our, um, our cube that has the grain structure in, it's very interesting when you see the results. So the, the, the top set of results here are with the microstructure considered, whereas the bottom set of results are without microstructure. In other words, the bottom set are conventional homogeneous isotropic. Okay, and so you can clearly see differences there. And so these, these are actually taken, they're different stress components. The first column is sigma x, the next one is sigma y, and the next one is tau xy, so shear stress as well. I won't go into the details of exactly where they are, but you can see, clearly see difference. So we don't get these beautiful symmetric uh, sort of residual stresses when we include the grain structure. And this is, a, again, going to be extremely important for an additive manufacturing world. Okay? Minute, uh, now, thank yeah. you very much. I'm almost done, so this is great, great uh, uh, I think, to remind me. Um, 
Now, one question is how good is this simplified Johnson Cook whole patch approach that runs in about 10 minutes um, versus another method? And so again, Johnson Cook whole patch, each grain has its own isotropic homogeneous model. So in the aggregate, it's inhomogeneous and isotropic, but we don't have the kinematic hardening. We don't have grain recrystallization, anything like that still. But we can, we can do a benchmark of this, this simplified approach with a crystal plasticity finite element method. So if you listen to Professor uh, Hu's talk and his uh, student Mazia's last night, they're very involved in CPFE. So in this case, we, we teamed up with uh, Professor Farhang Pobregraf from Ohio State. They did the CPFE model for this, including with the, with the high strain rate effects. And so if I just cycle through this, the results you're seeing are von Mises stress at uh, 0.5 microseconds. So it's basically after the pressure pulse is applied and you've got the plastic, def plastic uh, deformation and then the, the elastic stress wave reflection. So let's take a look through. This is half a microsecond. And this on the left, you have the johnson cook hole patch. On the right, you have the CPFE. That's one microsecond. 1.5 and so on. If you look at the trends, they're extremely close for these two. 2.5 microseconds all the way up, going five microseconds all the way up to 10 microseconds. And then here's after this is the static equilibrium, extremely close. And the peaks are about 300, 303 megapascals for Johnson Coca Cola patch approach and 300 for the CPFE, crystal plasticity. The, the crystal plasticity will take a couple of days to run and the Johnson Cook whole patch is, a, is about 10 minutes. And so this could be something that's really important for industrial application with additive manufacturing. So in summary, um, we, we know in additive manufacturing like SLM and DED, we can get significant intralayer and interlayer heat accumulation that leads to the grain structure variations. So we improved upon the classic kinetic Monte Carlo method to capture the dynamic effects of the heat pool, I'm sorry, the melt pool and heat affected zone. And then um, we know that um, in the past in LSP modeling that the grain structures have not been captured and we can do that now. And so in our simplified Johnson Cook whole Petra material modeling approach, we show very good agreement with crystal plasticity fine element, but just a fraction of the runtime. And with that, thank you very much and take any questions. Great, appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Malik, uh, one question, a quick, uh, if we can give a quick answer on it, I think it'd be great. And then we'll uh, move to the next presentation. The question is, is there any effect of grain orientation on the shockwave travel or propagation in, in the simulations? Yeah, and, 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 and the truth is, at this point, it's too early for us to tell. We haven't studied yet. So these are really brand new results from this year. And all we've done so far is just um, try to benchmark the residual stresses with another method. Um, but these are great questions. And, and I think that, you know, uh, Professor Hu's group in, in the Shanghai Zhou Tong University and our group and others will be really looking at these questions. But it, it, those are fantastic uh, things to ask. And it's just too early right now. But I imagine that there'll be significant effect of the grain orientation. Great. Thank you for that answer. And uh, with that, we'll end this presentation and quickly get moved over to our next presenter.